brought a train set, too. And he brought a workbench for Robbie. See, look at the train. You see, put it on the track. Yeah. Well, look, Robbie. When did Robbie get a car? Look, look what Robbie got. Robbie got a tool chest. Look, that's for you, Robbie. That's for you. Can you hit the nail? And look, it has a ruler. See? Oh, boy. Robbie, look at Mommy. And look, there's a car here for you. Sammy got a train set. Robbie? No, that, that's what the train set came in, honey. That's what Santa kept it in when he rode in his sleigh. Sammy, you must have been good this year. He brought a high chair to my baby. Oh, Sammy, yeah. just what you needed. Mm. Clown Dog has a place to eat now. And, and we can even take that, take that and the trunk and take it home. I think that we can. What did the train have a rest? Yeah. I thought it did last night too. Sammy, did you get everything you wanted? Sammy, are you gonna play with your train set? Robbie a train set, he brought Robbie a workbench, he brought Sammy a high chair for her baby, and a car. And this way my baby can eat. Yeah, now she can eat breakfast next to you this morning. Mm. You gonna feed her breakfast you with feed her some breakfast? eggs? There's no eggs in this Oh, did you run out? Where'd they go? Look, Robbie. Let's see, it's squeezed in right there. Sammy, did, did Santa Claus eat the cookies? He ate all the cookies? Oh, I'll bet he liked them. Did he eat the cookies, honey? He certainly did, huh? Are your eggs in there? Are you going to feed your baby now? Oh, she will like those eggs. And we need a plate. You need a plate? Hmm. Christmas, 1988. Say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. How old are you? Two. Say, I'm two. I'm three. No, you're, you're two not and three. A half. Say, I'm two and a half. I'm two and a half. Say, I love my daddy. I love my daddy. I love my mommy. I like my mommy. And Santa Claus is really good to me. Santa Claus is really good to me. What'd you what did get? Santa Claus bring you? A high chair. For who? For my baby. And what else? A house. A house? And what a else? A train set? Did you get a train set? Let's play in the snow. You want to do an angel? You want to do an angel? You want mommy to help you? Okay. Mommy. <laughs> Here we are, Sam. Okay. Ready to make an angel? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> make an angel. Spread out your arms. Do your feet. Oh. Your angel? Isn't that a nice? 
Mike Angel? Another one. Another one over here? Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Is that fun, Sammy? <laughs> Do your arms. Move your arms, oh good! That's it, Sammy, you're making an angel. And these are the houses around. Nice place, huh? Beep. People going skiing. Watch mommy, Sammy. A street. Would have been great to have a sleigh ride, but we couldn't find anybody with a sled or a horse. That's where we're staying. Daddy, you're not there. Uh oh, better hurry. <laughs> Sammy, look, it's so deep. Let me get the camera on her out here. Mommy. Let me get the camera on her out here. Mommy. It's no cold, Sammy. It's cold. <laughs> okay, let's put it back on. Quick, hurry. Okay, okay, okay. Get your thumb in. Thumb in that little hole. Okay, there. Sammy, you're in deep snow. Okay. Make sure that you hold my hand. Well, wait, let me put my gloves on, okay? Don't walk yet or you're going to fall down. Tell me that snow's so deep. You like snow? Okay, you want to hold Daddy's hand? You want me to go there? I like snow. Yeah, you want to hold Daddy's this hand? This is walk, cold snow. Walk towards Mommy. Deep. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you run? Fast. <laughs> 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 Sammy's stuck in the Look snow! Daddy, help me. Okay, big girl. Walk. Okay, let's walk. Deep, huh? I mean, I don't want to go over there. My legs are going to get wet. Why? Because it's wet snow. <laughs> deep, huh? You're in the deep. You want to walk over there? Honk. Over there. <laughs> Snowball it, Daddy! Oh no! Daddy, get snowball! Oh, look at that snowball! <laughs> Daddy threw a snowball at you, Sammy! Oh no! Don't throw it at Daddy! Oh! The doctor said he didn't. It knocked you down, don't, didn't it? Don't ever do that again, because you knocked me down. Okay, you know Sam. Okay, don't throw when, you want to throw it at Daddy? Yeah. Here, no, here. Here, you hold that one. Throw it at Daddy. Oh! It knocked Daddy down! Oh, oh no! Daddy's going to get Daddy! You're going to pick me up? Okay. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Should we throw it at Mommy? Here we go, Mommy. <laughs> oh, 
Uh-oh, casualty. What happened? Are you okay? Do Daddy hold you? And I will help you. By the way, today's Christmas Day, 1988. We're having fun. Robbie's taking a nap. Yay! <laughs> yeah, poor Robbie. He hasn't had too much fun on this trip. Sammy, I was going to do something to you in the snow. There's the mountains all around. Oh no! We're gonna have to bury you in the snow! Ah! <laughs> Can you do a somersault in the snow? No. Yes. Do a somersault, Tim. Put your head down. Do a somersault. I'll help you. I'll do that. Okay, you do it. I'll buy yourself. Over there. Oh, oh Sammy. Here. <laughs> again? No. Do it again, Sammy. Again? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy, you got snow in your head. Cold snow. No. <laughs> There. All better. Your hat. So your ears don't get cold, okay? Any pretty scenery? Not again. Not again. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Big peak up there. You want mommy to do? Beautiful view from inside the house. Okay, We've Sammy. got to make this an annual tradition. Get mommy somersault. Okay. Here's Mommy's gonna do a somersault, Sammy. Are you ready? Hold on. Here we go. Okay. Are you ready, We're ready. Are you ready. Here goes Mommy. Whee! <laughs> now Mommy make an angel. <laughs> Whoa, Daddy's sliding. Yay! Yay! Sammy, look at Daddy. Sammy, fall down in the snow. Sammy? Now it's your turn. <laughs> ah! Boom! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Deep for Sammy. Okay, Sammy, now it's Mommy's turn. Here I go. Here goes Mommy. Look at Mommy, I Sam. Know, Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> Climb the mountain. <laughs> I'm going to get you. Oh, no. Ah. The abominable mommy monster. I'm the abominable snow monster. <laughs> oh, Sam. <laughs> oh, I got you. She doesn't know where to laugh to cry. Say Merry Christmas. Christmas, 19 years. Sure. In a minute, you'll be able to get stuff in our faces. The Tahoe Expedition. Yeah. We've been rescued many times this week. Hey, here, here's home. the Tahoe. May we have a second home here within the next two or three years. Here, Certainly. Yeah. In the 90s. At least yes. one. Yes, at least one. It's interconnecting uh, it's a water heater. So we use the brakes. Two off. Why not have two? Say Merry Christmas, Sammy. Merry Christmas. I just want to do something. I have to get to you. Robbie likes it. That's fine. Sing happy birthday to Jesus. 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 Happy birthday to
think this is funny. Let's get Cheryl. Cheryl moose her hair. Let's get Cheryl moose. Cheryl's got a change of light. I'm thinking of a new light. Notice that glow? Light just called. And she came out, and this is what she found. Robbie had gotten into the box of Cheerios, and Cheerios were everywhere. Look at all the Cheerios. Sammy, you tell me what happened out here. A whole box of Cheerios in the hall. And are you guys having fun? Today is January 10th, 1989. I'll have Cheerios in my house forever and ever. Won't I? Sammy, what do the little girls say that eat Cheerios? Cheerios. You did this, Robbie. Robbie, look at Mommy. You did this. You did this. You're going to give me some Cheerios, huh? You guys. What a mess. Can you pick it up, you two? You guys going to clean it up? Oh, come on. Robbie thinks that's fun. <laughs> We're going to have a big mess to clean up, aren't we? Can you count them, Sammy? Can you count that high? No, you can't even do it? Can you, Robbie? <coughs> Robbie, you better say, uh-oh. Cheerios, Cheerios, Cheerios. I'll probably never buy them again. <laughs> Can you pick them up and put them back in the box, Sam? Good job. Robbie, are you going to help? Pick them up and put them back in the box. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you for the box. Go pick up the Cheerios, Robbie. argument that gotten us into the trouble on the deficit side. So I'll just keep saying I am one. I, uh, I'm not going to go down there and try to dump the sludge from Massachusetts off the beaches off of uh, New Jersey. I'm not going to do that. That boo is excessively loud. Can you add five seconds, Bernie? <laughs> out of fairness, come on. Give me five. I mean, this guy, this is too much down there. But, but I'm not going to do that. I am an environmentalist. I believe in our parks. I believe in the President's Commission on Outdoors. And uh, I'll do a good job because I am committed. Governor Dukakis, you have one minute to respond. All right, I'm not sure I can get all of this in in one minute. George, we have supply management today under the 1985 bill. It's called Set Aside. Secondly, if you are so opposed to the grain embargo, why did you ask the godfather of the grain embargo to be one of your top foreign policy advisors. I'm against the grain embargo. It was a mistake. I'm also against the pipeline embargo, which you folks attempted to impose. That was a mistake as well and cost thousands of jobs to American workers uh, in the Midwest and, and all over the United States of America. Margaret, once again, I don't know which George Bush I'm talking about here or looking at. The George Bush who was a charter member of the environmental wrecking crew that went to Washington in the early 80s and did a job in the EPA or the one we've been seeing and listening to the past two or three months. But let me say this, because he spent millions and millions of dollars on advertising uh, on the subject of Boston Harbor. 
Um, George, Boston Harbor was polluted for 100 years. I'm the first governor to clean it up. No thanks to you. No thanks to you. And we've been cleaning it up for four governor. years. We passed landmark legislation in 84. No thanks to you. Did everything you could to kill the Clean Water Act and those grants. Governor. Which make it possible for states and local communities to clean up rivers and harbors and streams. Andrea Mitchell has a question for you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Vice President, Jimmy Carter has called this the worst campaign ever. Richard Nixon has called it trivial, superficial, and inane. Whoever started down this road first of negative campaigning, the American people from all reports coming to us are completely fed up. Now, do you have any solutions to suggest? Is there time left to fix it? There are 26 days left. For instance, would you agree to another debate before it's all over, so that the American people, so that the American people would have another chance before election day to compare you two. No, I will not agree to another debate. The American people are up to here with debates. They had 30 of them. We had seven of them. Now we got got three of them. I am going to carry this election debate all across this country in the last whatever remains of the last three and a half weeks or whatever we have, and the answer is no. I am not going to have any more debates. We don't need any more debates. I've spelled out my position. In terms of negative campaigning, you know, I don't want to sound like a kid in the schoolyard. He started it. But uh, take a look at the Democratic Convention. <laughs> take a look at it. Do you remember the senator from Boston chanting out there and the ridicule factor from that lady from uh, Texas that was on there? I mean, come on. This was just outrageous, but uh, I, I'm, I'll try. I'll try harder to keep it on a high plane. But let me, let me. If you could accept a little criticism, I went all across Central Illinois and spoke about agricultural issues in about seven stops. We had some fun. Crystal Gale, Loretta Lynn, with us. And they got up and sang. Went to little towns. And I talked to agriculture, and not one thing did I see with respect on your network about my views on agriculture, and not one did I read in any newspaper. Why? Because you're so interested in a poll that might have been coming out, or because somebody had said something nasty about somebody else. And so I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. Somebody hit me and said, Barry Goldwater said you ought to talk on the issues more. How can Barry Goldwater, sitting in Arizona, know whether I'm talking on the issues or not when we put out position paper after position paper, he puts out position paper after position paper, and we see this much about it because everyone else is fascinated with polls and who's up or down today and who's going to be up or down tomorrow. So I think we can all share with respect in the fact that maybe these, the message is not getting out. But it's not getting out because there are too few debates. There will be no more debates. Governor Dukakis, you have one minute to respond, sir. Well, I can understand after the vice presidential debate why... Uh, Mr. Bush would want no more debates. That's my five seconds. <laughs> Andrew, I think we both have a responsibility to try to address the issues. Yes, we have fundamental differences. I think a great many of them have come out today. But I think if we get rid of the labels, and I'm not keeping count, but I think Mr. Bush has used the label liberal at least ten times. Yeah. I had a dollar, George, for... Every time you use that label, I qualify for one of those tax breaks for the rich that you want to give away. <laughs> Isn't that the point? Uh, most Americans believe in basic values. We have differences about how to achieve them. I want to move forward. I want this nation to move forward. Uh, I'm concerned about the fact that 10% of our manufacturing and 20% of our banking and nearly half of the real estate in the city of Los Angeles are in the hands of foreign investors. I'm concerned about what that does to our future. I'm concerned about the fact that so many of our securities are in the hands of foreign banks because of these massive deficits. But those are the issues on which we ought to be debating. And Governor. If we can just put away the flag factories and the balloons and those kinds of things and get on to a real discussion of these issues, I think we'll, we'll have a Andre, good time today. Andrea Mitchell has a question for you, Governor Dukakis. Beg your pardon? Andrea Mitchell has a question for you, sir. Well, we're talking about issues, so let's return to something you said earlier about the modernization of land-based missiles. You said that you didn't rule it out, but that there are limits to what we can spend. And then you went on to talk about a much more expensive part of our defense strategy, namely conventional forces. 
Do you somehow see conventional forces as a substitute for our strategic forces? And in not talking about the land-based missiles and not committing to modernizing, do you somehow believe that we can have a survivable nuclear force based on the air and sea legs of our triad? I think we ought to be looking at modernization. I think we ought to be exploring less expensive ways to get it on land, and we ought to make sure that we have an effective and strong and credible nuclear deterrent, but we also need well-equipped and well-trained well and well-supported conventional forces. And every defense expert I know, including people in the Pentagon itself, will tell you that given the level of dispense, defense spending and the level of defense appropriations, which the Congress has now approved, the President has signed, there's no way that you can do all of these things and do them well. That's why tough choices will be required. Choices I'm prepared to make, Mr. Bush is not prepared to make. But Andrea, I think we can go far beyond this as well because we have opportunities now, step by step, to bring down the level of strategic weapons, and get a test ban treaty, uh, negotiate those conventional force reductions. I would challenge Mr. Gorbachev to uh, join with us in limiting and eliminating regional conflict uh, in the Middle East, in Central America. Let's get him working on Syria, their client state, and see if we can't get them to join Israel and other Arab nations, uh, if at all possible, and Arab leaders in, in finally bringing peace to that troubled region. And I think that's one reason why we need fresh leadership in the White House that can make progress now in bringing peace to the Middle East. Let's go to work and end this fiasco in Central America, a failed policy which has actually increased Cuban and Soviet influence. The Democratic leaders of Central and Latin America want to work with us. Uh, I've met with them. I know them. I've spent time in South America. I speak the language. So does Senator Benson. We want to work with them and build a, a new relationship, and they with us. But not a one of those key Democratic leaders support our policy in Central America. And we've got to work with them if we're going to create an environment for human rights and democracy for the people of this hemisphere and go to work on our single most important problem, and that is the avalanche of drugs that is pouring into our country and virtually destroying those countries. Those are the kinds of priorities uh, for national security and for foreign policy that I want to pursue. Uh, Mr. Bush and I have major differences Governor. on these issues, and I hope very much to be president and pursue them. Mr. Vice President, you have one minute. In, in terms of regional tensions, we have now gotten the attention of the Soviet Union. And the reason we've gotten it is because they see us now as unwilling to make the very kinds of unil unilateral cuts that have been called for and to go for the discredited freeze. My opponent had trouble, criticized, criticized us on our po policy in Angola. It now looks, because of steady negotiation, that we may have an agreement that will remove the Cubans from Angola. We see the, the Russians coming out of Afghanistan. That wouldn't have stopped if we hadn't been willing, wouldn't have even started the, Cub the Soviets coming out if we hadn't even been willing to support the freedom fighters there. And the policy in Central America, regrettably, has failed because the Congress has been unwilling to support those who have been fighting for freedom. Those Sandinistas came in and betrayed the trust of the revolution. They said it was about democracy, and they have done, done nothing other than solidify their Marxist domination over that country. Ann Compton for Governor Dukakis. Governor, nuclear weapons need, need nuclear material replenished on a regular basis. And just this week, yet another nuclear manufacturing plant was closed because of safety concerns. Some of the Pentagon fear that uh, too much priority has been put on new weapons programs, not enough on current programs, and worry that the resulting shortage would be amounting to nothing less than unilateral nuclear disarmament. Is that a priority that you feel has been ignored by this administration? Are the Pentagon officials making too much of it? Well, it's a great concern of mine, and I think of all Americans, and, and perhaps the Vice President can tell us what's been going on. This is another example of misplaced priorities of an administration which wants to spend billions on weapon systems that we don't need and can't afford, and now confronts us with a very serious problem in plants that are supposed to be producing tritium and plutonium and uh, providing the necessary materials for existing weapons. Yes, if we don't do something about it, we may find ourselves unilaterally, if I may use that term, dismantling some of these weapons. What's been going on? Who's been in charge? Who's been managing this system? Why have there been these safety violations? Why are these plants being closed down? I don't know what the latest cost estimates are, but it's going to be in the range of 25, 50, 75, 100 billion dollars. Uh, now, 
somebody has to bear the responsibility for this. Uh, maybe the vice president has an answer. But I'm somebody who believes very strongly in taking care of the fundamentals first before you start new stuff. And that's something which uh, will be a priority of ours in the new administration because without it, we cannot have the effective and strong and credible nuclear deterrent we must have. Mr. Vice President, you have one minute. That is the closest I've ever heard the governor of Massachusetts come to support anything having to do with nuclear. That's about as close as I've ever heard him. Yes, this Savannah River plant me needs to be made more safe. Will he join me in suggesting that we may need another plant, maybe in Idaho, to take care of the requirements, nuclear material requirements, for our Defense Department? I hope he will. This sounds like real progress here, because uh, we've had a big difference on the safe use of nuclear power for our energy base. I believe that we must use clean, safe nuclear power. I believe that we, the more dependent we become on foreign oil, the less our national security is enhanced. And therefore, I've made some proposals to strengthen the domestic oil energy uh, industry by more incentive going in to look for and find and produce oil, made him some incentives in terms of secondary and tertiary production, but we're going to have to use more gas, more coal, and more safe nuclear power for our energy base. So I am one who believes that we Mr. can and must do what he's talking about now. Ann Compton has a question for you. Mr. Vice President, as many as 100 officials in this administration have left the government under an ethical cloud. Some uh, have been indicted, some convicted. Many of the cases have involved undue influence once they are outside of government. If you become president, will you lock that revolving door that has allowed some men and women in the government to come back and lobby the very departments they once managed? Yeah, and I'll apply it to Congress, too. I'll do both. I'll do both. Because I think, you see, I am one who, I get kidded by being a little old-fashioned on these things, but I do believe in public service. I believe that public service is honorable. And I don't think anybody has a, has a call on people in their administrations going astray. His chief education advisor is in jail he's in jail because he betrayed the public trust the head of education and yet this man the governor equated the president to a rotting fish he said that a fish rots from the head down as he was going after ed meese look we need the highest possible ethical standards i will have an ethical office in the white house that will be under the president's personal uh, concern I will see that these standards apply to the United States Congress. I hope I will do a good job as one who has had a relatively clean record with no conflicts of interest in his own public life, as has the governor, to exhort young people to get into public service. But there is no corner on, on this uh, sleaze factor, believe me. And it's a disgrace, and I will do my level best to clean it up, recognizing that you can't legislate morality. But I do believe that with my record in Congress, having led the new congressman to a code of ethics through major, main emphasis on it in full disclosure, that I've got a good record. And uh, there are more, if you want to talk about percentage appointments, more members of Congress who have been under investigation percentage-wise than people in the executive branch. And so it isn't one, and state governments have had a tough time. His, some of his college presidents aren't exactly uh, holier than thou. So uh, let's, let's not be throwing stones about it. Let's say this isn't Democrat or Republican, and it isn't liberal or conservative. Let's vow to work together to do something about it. Governor, you have one minute to respond. And I would agree that integrity is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. It's an American issue. But here again, I don't know which George Bush I'm listening to. Wasn't this the Mr. Bush that supported Mr. Meese? called James Watt an excellent Secretary of the Interior, <laughs> provided support for some of these people, supported the nomination of Robert Bork, the Supreme Court of the United States. You we've had dozens, speech. we've had dozens and dozens of officials in this administration who have left under a cloud, who have left with a special prosecutor on their arm, have been indicted, convicted. This isn't the kind of administration we need. And one of the reasons our selection of a running mate is so important and is such a test of the kinds of standards we'll set is because it tells the American people in advance of the election just what kind of people we're looking for. I picked Lloyd Benson. 
Mr. Bush picked Dan Quaid. Dan Quayle. I think that says a great deal to the American people about the standards we'll set and the quality of the people that we will pick to serve in our administration. To each of you candidates, regrettably, I have to inform you that we have come to the end of our questions. That's a pity. Before I ask the candidates to make their closing remarks, on behalf of the Commission on Presidential Debates, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Governor Dukakis, yours is the first closing statement, sir. 28 years ago, as a young man just graduated from law school, I came to this city, came clear across the country to watch John Kennedy be nominated for the presidency of the United States right here in Los Angeles. I never dreamed that someday I would win that nomination and, and be my party's nominee for president. That's America. That's why I'm proud and grateful to be a citizen of this country. 26 days from today, you and millions of Americans will choose two people to lead us into the future as president and vice president of the United States. Our opponents say uh, things are okay. Don't rock the boat. Not to worry. They say we should be satisfied. But I don't think we can be satisfied when we're spending $150 billion a year in interest alone on the national debt, much of it going to foreign bankers, or when 25% of our high school students are dropping out of school, or when we have two and a half million of our fellow citizens, a third of them veterans, who are homeless and living on streets and in doorways in this country, or when Mr. Bush's prescription for our economic future is another tax giveaway to the rich. We can do better than that. Not working with government alone, but all of us working together. Lloyd Benson and I are optimists, and so are the American people. And we ask you for our hand, for your hands and, and your hearts and your votes on the 8th of November so we can move forward into the future. Kitty and I are very grateful to all of you for the warmth and the hospitality that you've given to us in your homes and communities all across this country. We love you and we're grateful to you for everything that you've given to us. And we hope that we'll be serving you in the White House in January of 1989. Thank you and God bless you. Vice President Bush, your Some, closing statement, sir. Sometimes it does seem that a campaign generates more heat than light. And so let me repeat, I do have respect for my opponent, for his family, uh, for the justifiable pride he takes in his heritage. But we have enormous differences. I want to hold the line on taxes and keep this the longest expansion in modern history going until everybody in America benefits. I want to invest in our children because I mean it when I say I want a kinder and gentler nation. And by that, I want to have child care where the families, the parents have control. I want to keep our neighborhoods much, much better in terms of anti-crime. And that's why I would appoint judges that have a little more sympathy for the victims of crime and a little less for the criminals. That's why I do feel if some police officer is gunned down that the death, death penalty is required. I want to help those with disabilities fit into the mainstream. There is much to be, a d be done. This election is about big things. And perhaps the biggest is world peace. And I ask you to consider the experience I have had in working with a president who has revolutionized the situation around the world. America stands tall again, and as a result, we are credible, and we have now achieved a historic arms control agreement. I want to build on that. I'd love to be able to say to my grandchildren four years after my first term, I'd like to say, your grandfather, working with the leaders of the Soviet Union, working with the leaders of Europe, was able to ban chemical and biological weapons from the face of the earth. Lincoln called this country the last best hope of man on earth. And he was right then, and we still are, the last best hope hope of man on earth, and I ask for your support on November 8th, and I will be a good president. Working together, we can do wonderful things for the United States and for the free world. Thank you very, very much.
Governor Dukakis and his wife, who's joined him on the podium, as has Mrs. Bush joined her husband to say uh, in this uh, reasonably convivial atmosphere this evening, reasonably convivial, thank you to the members of the panel, the wife politicians come along at this point and thank members of the panel. I'm not altogether sure why. Frank Ferenkopf, the chairman of the Republican Party, Paul Kirk, the Republican Answer, Master. We want to know your opinion. Yes, tell us. Is it right to kill her? Is he among you who is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. your accusers. Is there anyone here who's condemned you? No. No one. Then neither do I condemn you. No. Go. And sin no more. I was worried about her. She said some things to me that she never said before. I don't know. I don't know. I guess I was just trying to make sure she didn't get in any trouble. There's a lot of crazy people out there. You're telling me. And what did she say? Not important. Really? Does she know you love her? I'm sorry. It's just so clear. She doesn't know, does she? David decided to do just that and rushed to Maddie's house at four in the morning to share his startling realization with her. Now listen, I know it's four o'clock in the morning. Can I help you? Which brings us to tonight, which reminds me, let me make it absolutely clear that my appearance here on Moonlighting will in no way compromise my integrity as a television critic. <clears throat> sure, it's just a thank you note.
When the sun goes down, I'm gonna light up the night. Silver label, red ribbon, a taste that's right. Gonna light up the night. chicken and little darling you taste so grand i love to hold you in my hand new chicken little sandwiches you cost just a little but people love you a lot Detective Agency, has your dog jumped the fence? Did Fido get lost? Put us on his scent at our low dog finder cost. We'll hit the ground running, get to the pound fast, and retrieve your loved one before he gets gas. <coughs> Herbert, is that you? You sound terrible. Were you out late, too? Oh, you think you might be coming down with something? Sure, I'll tell Miss Hayes, but she's not here yet, either. Miss Radisson's here. But he looks like you sound. Was there a party last night that no one told me about? Morning, Mr. Pesto. Yeah? Mr. Addison, Miss Hayes just came in. Morning. Morning. Sorry I'm late. You been late? I didn't even notice. I was so busy. Busy? Doing what? Setting up Mr. Pesto with the monthly billing, reviewing the status of our ongoing accounts, refilling the toilet paper in the executive washrooms. Really? We have four past two accounts. The Redfield case still needs a follow-up, and the Willie's bathroom has much better graffiti. You did all that this morning? Well, I had the market with me. The wall was there. We are running a business here, aren't we? That we are. So? So? So what was it? Dog buried your briefcase? Just washed your car and couldn't do a thing with it? Ran off with a circus sideshow but couldn't grow a beard? I'm sorry? You should be. What? David, I just overslept. Overslept? Overslept. I turned off the alarm and went back to sleep. When I woke up, I noticed what time it was. I got here as quickly as I could. Besides, I thought you didn't notice. Hey, you brought it up. Of course, there are two entire hours unaccounted for. This from a man who has entire weekends unaccounted for? Never without a good excuse. Or at least a bad one. David, I just got a good night's sleep, that's all. You should give it a try sometime. Me? I slept like a babe. Still made it in by nine, though. I don't remember seeing hall monitor under your job description. You don't have to answer to me. I'm just your business partner. Partner? Just don't blame me if they draw their own conclusions. What conclusions? And who are they? They are them. And the kind of conclusions people draw when a certain someone comes traipsing in, smile on her face, spring on her step two hours late. What are you getting at, David? Nothing. What conclusions? Forget it. Forget what? Excuse me, there's a woman here to see you. Send her in. Hello, uh, please come in, Ms. Johnson. Elaine Johnson. I'm Madeline Hayes. This is my associate, David Addison. Won't you sit down? How may we help you? 
I think my boyfriend is in love with his wife. What? I'm the other woman. Which, by the way, is just fine with me. I've known Alan for three years, and we have had this understanding. His marriage was wanting. My love life was wanting. It made sense. It makes sense. I have a demanding career. I'm very comfortable giving him three or four hours a couple of times a week. But? But. He's abruptly canceled plans several times in the past month. And I hear the guilt in his voice when he tries to explain. He won't look me in the eye anymore. He avoids talking about us, about our relationship. And then, the other night, he fell asleep. His wallet was just sitting there on the nightstand. I found a picture of him. And her. And the kids. He just didn't look like a guy who was wanting anymore. I just want to know what's going on. If he's pricing station wagons or looking at a bigger house, I don't want to be the last to know. Will you excuse us for a minute, please? All right, all right, all right. Let's flip the page. Cut to the meat of the scene. You're outraged. You're disgusted. It'll be a warm day in Nome before you'd even consider taking a case like this one. That's just fine. I just want you to know that not taking this case is peachy keen with me. Fade out. Amen. End of story. I don't know. I think maybe we should take it. What? I think we should take it. I mean, hell, David, it's a case. I think we got a bad connection. Come on, life is short. Did they switch the names on the script? Not even talking about a woman who's found a whole new way to define being faithful. Not the sort of woman you'd normally introduce to the bridge club. Maybe a thing like being faithful isn't that easy to define. Maybe it's not so black and white. The fact is we're a detective agency, and she's got a case we can handle, so I say we handle it. Glad to see things are finally loosening up around here. Miss us? We decided to take your case. That's wonderful, thank you. I've had such bad luck finding someone. Agencies tend to get judgmental about this sort of thing. No, here we don't. I've written everything down. Addresses, hangouts, daily schedule. His name is Alan McClafferty. Thank you. Well, we'll be in touch as soon as we know something. The sooner, the better reason comes to me. I'll be looking forward to it. It was very nice to meet you. one case I'm going to enjoy staying on top of. Why do I feel like this is all for my benefit? I give up. Why? I don't approve of flirting with a total stranger. So don't do it. And when'd you change your mind about total strangers? What's bothering you? Hey, I'm just responding to an attractive woman. <sighs> okay, it's worked. I'm angry. I have no idea what's wrong. But if you're not going to tell me, I'd appreciate you leaving my office. Maybe there is something wrong. Maybe there is something bothering me. You skipped out of here last night ranting about getting reckless with a total stranger. And you show up here at 11 o'clock. Well, maybe I was worried about you. I guess it wouldn't occur to you that I could be worried about you. That just maybe I'd assume the worst. I'm sorry. I just stopped and got some groceries last night. Got home early. When I got there, there was a message from an old friend. We got together, stayed up a little late. I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. An old friend? Yeah, I've known Sam since I was six. Promised him some lunch, and I've got a couple of things I want to do. Be back here about 2.30 and get started on this case? Yeah, right. Bye. corn for breakfast. Want a little milk for that? No, thanks, Dad, but how about some sugar for your, uh, what is that, acorn? Nuggets. Nutri-grain nuggets. Mm -hmm. Sounds healthy. Yep, whole grain. Whole grain. <laughs> where, where are the holes in here? <laughs> Introducing Nutri-grain nuggets, the first whole grain nugget cereal. That's really crunchy. Whole grain's not half bad. Oh, Kellogg's yeah. Nutri-grain nuggets. Finally, a whole grain nugget. I can just hear Miss Chenard now. And how did we 
spend our summer vacation. Sir, would you choose hamburger A, a Wendy's hamburger, which is always served fresh, or hamburger B, which is pre-made and sits around? B. But B wasn't just made. Neither was the Mona Lisa. Picasso painted that 400 years ago, and now it's worth 20 mil. Da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa. He did that. Wouldn't you choose the fresh hamburger? Choose Wendy's. Real life is an acquired taste. Thirty something this fall. guy sit at the desk over there yeah but shouldn't you be in bed oh the flu do you know i'm feeling so much better i <coughs> i'd almost forgotten that i was sick that's terrific but you know you could have a relapse if you're not careful what did you have for dinner last night uh nachos and a jelly donut or was it a bear claw well i'm coming over to your house and i'm making you a decent meal agnes that's not necessary Necessary has nothing to do with it. You really are worried about me, aren't you? Yeah. Excuse me for barging in on you like this, Mr. Addison, but I just had to tell you what a terrific time I had last night. You know, you and me, out in the field, one on one. What time you got? Three oh three. Three hours. What? Who, Miss Hayes? <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that, Mr. Addison. I mean, she probably just had lunch. And then, you know how women are. One thing leads to another. Actually, that was that was what I wanted to talk to you about. Maddie? Well, no, not her. I mean, not her specifically, but women. In general, Desiree in particular. Desiree? The cocktail waitress at the bar last night. I brought the car around like you asked, and I waited. I really did. But when you didn't show up, I went back into the bar. I dropped some dough into the jukebox, and as fate would have it, Desiree and I both turned out to be these huge grassroots fans. And so I took her home. She owes you one. It's a killer trying to get a cab after 2 a.m. Uh, no, 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 no. Not her home, Mr. Addison. Mine. You know the Matterhorn at Disneyland, sir? And there was no line. Just wave after wave of pleasure breaking over our naked bodies. Two hearts beating as one. All night long. Listen, Herbert. I'm